This week's block of scripture that we will be studying is 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 2 to chapter 7. Because of the length of it, I divide it in two parts. So the first part, we will consider 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse to chapter 3. The importance of 1 Corinthians. It can be challenging to live with faith and obedience in our modern world amid strife, skepticism, and immorality. Modern readers of 1 Corinthians can find strength in Paul's words to the saints in Corinth, who struggle with disunity, false doctrines, and immoral weaknesses in the society in which they lived. Paul addressed a variety of topics in his letter such as how to promote unity in the church, how to learn the things of God, the role of the physical body as a temple for the Holy Ghost, the nature of spiritual gifts, and the reality of the resurrection. I think I remember reading somewhere someone has kind of compared Corinth to being the Las Vegas of its day and its corruption and immorality. Background to 1 Corinthians. Ancient Corinth was a city of debauchery, lewdness, and evil. Even by pagan standards, the Corinthians were notor notoriously sensual and immoral. Their very religion itself centered around the worship of Aphrodite, or, or Venus, and included the sacrificing of chastity of by virgins. Drunkenness, lasciviousness, and sexual sin were proverbial. And as is natural in such a society, the people of the Roman colony of Corinth were given to fraction and strife and to the solving of moral issues through philosophical contentions. It can be challenging. Oh. Sorry, that got repeated. In this climate of evil, Paul had raised up a congregation of saints who forsook the world that was Corinth and sought for a better life in the cause of Christ. But these new, and in some cases only semi-converted saints, soon reeked with troubles in their own select groups. Factions arose in the church. Some sought to solve spiritual problems by reason and philosophical dispute. The saints, the spirit, gifts of the Spirit and the partaking of the Lord's Supper were twisted and debased. Some rejected Paul as an apostle, others denied the resurrection, and immorality and wanton conduct were found among those who had turned from Satan to Christ. Paul himself had personal knowledge of the temper and feelings of the people. By the whistlings of the Spirit, he knew what should be said to them to reclaim them to the gospel standard. Hence, he had written them an epistle directing, among other things, that they refrain from associating with fornicators. What else this epistle commanded, we can only speculate. But undoubtedly, un undoubtedly it summarized many, many basic gospel principles, I'm sorry, go do gospel doctrines, and exhorted the Christian saints to serve God and keep his commandments. Upon receipt of this epistle, the contentious souls in the Corinthian congregation wrote a reply taking issue with some of the doctrines of the apostles and asking detailed questions about his teachings. Thereupon, with vigor and true apostolic zeal, Paul wrote a second epistle, canonized and known as the First Corinthians. So, First Corinthians is actually answering questions to a epistle he wrote before this, which we do not have, which answered the points raised by his detractors and further exemplified the teachings of the original letter. Unfortunately, we do not know, we do not know what was said in Paul's epistle to the Corinthians, nor in their reply to him. All that has come to us is his reply to the reply. We have thus only a few comments about certain aspects of the doctrines they were considering. One cannot, for instance, learn the doctrine of eternal marriage by studying 1 Corinthians, for it is not there recorded. One does not find in its application of the doctrine of a special situation, which application cannot be understood without a prior knowledge of the doctrine itself. 
in addition to his personal knowledge and to these other documents unknown to us but believed but available to him, Paul had received detailed oral reports about conditions in the Corinth from members of the household of Chloe. Here again, we are without background information, which would be most helpful in putting 1 Corinthians into proper perspective. But with, all it, but with it all, the document as we now have it is an inspired and inspiring recitation of some of the most glorious aspects of the doctrines of salvation. In it we read profound explanations of spiritual gifts, of the resurrection, of the degrees of glory in the world to come. We learn baptism for the dead, are reminded that Christ is God of Israel and that there are God's many and Lord's many. We read of charity, unity, moral cleanliness, personal revelation, the sacrament, the spiritual powers of the saints, and much, much more. Truly the Lord's hand had been in the preservation of this storehouse gospel knowledge so needed for our education and guidance. What are some distinctive features of 1 Corinthians? The New Testament contains more counsel from Paul to the church members in Corinthians, Corinthians than to any other branch. In fact, Paul's two epistles to the Corinthians contains one-fourth of all of Paul's existing writings. In 1 Corinthians, Paul sought to strengthen the converts in Corinth who struggled with reverting to their past beliefs and practices. Among the many topics that Paul addressed in this letter, he focused on the atonement of Jesus Christ, the Savior's death, his resurrection, and eventually return to Jesus Christ to earth, the return of Jesus Christ to earth. While Paul's writings to the Romans and Galatians clearly teach that salvation is not gained through obedience to the law, Paul goes a step further in 1 Corinthians, Corinthians emphasizing the importance of keeping the commandments of God and the law of Christ. To whom is Paul expounding the doctrines of 1 Corinthians 2? Paul is writing to able, conscientious, faithful saints, not to the world. This is why worldly commentaries or commentaries from other uh, religions will always get things wrong in 1 Corinthians because they do not know the basic standard principles of Christ's true church and his true doctrines. He is giving counsel to those who have the gift of the Holy Ghost and who already know the doctrines of salvation, not to sectarians and not to mankind in general. Among them, as among always is the case, are the weak and dissonant members who need counsel, direction, and encouragement, but with it all, they are God's chosen people, a fact which must be crystal clear if we are to comprehend the, con the counsel about to fall from the apostles' lips. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Christ is not divided and preached by the weak and simple. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 2, and to those who have become sanctified in Christ. To be sanctified is to become wholly separated for a specific purpose, that we have no more disposition to do evil, but to do good continually. That is the specific purpose for which we were created. To do good continually, to become sanctified, and return back to our Father in Heaven. That was Messiah 5.2. The specific purpose of God's people have been separated or set apart for is to make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee above measure, and make thy name great among all nations, and thou shalt be blessed unto the sea and to thy seed after thee, that in their hands they shall bear this ministry and preach them to all nations, and I will bless them through thy name, for as many as receive this gospel shall be called after thy name. It's referring to Abraham. And shall be accounted thy seed, and shall rise up and bless thee as thy, 
their father, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee. And in thee, that is in thy priesthood, and in thy seed, that is the priesthood, for I give unto thee a promise that this right shall continue in thee, and in thy seed after thee, that is to say the literal seed, or the seed of the body, shall all the families of the earth be blessed, even with the blessings of the gospel, which are the blessings of salvation, even unto eternal life. That's Abraham chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. That tells us what we were set apart for, to be a blessing unto the world and to bring the gospel and priesthood to them. Thus, being called out of the world and into the church, called by the election of grace, which includes being foreordained to be members of the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. Paul taught that the saints in Corinth, that they were enriched by Jesus Christ in every way, in speech and in knowledge. This is similar to Alma's words, and to stand as a witness of God at all times and in all things and in all places, that you may be even unto death, that you may be redeemed of God, be numbered with those of the first resurrection, that you may have eternal life, Mosiah 18.9. Which conduct would enable the faithful saints to become blameless? That's verse 8 in 1 Corinthians. Meaning, innocent, not guilty of sin because of their faith and repentance in Christ's atonement. 1 Corinthians 10 through 12. Unity within the church and among the saints is the goal of the gospel. There is no place in the church of God for division for disagreement on doctrine, for cults and cliques, for, liable, for liberal views as contrasted with conservative concepts. Among the faithful saints, there is only one mind and one judgment, and these are the Lord's. Those with the full enjoyment of the Spirit learn the Lord's views on all things and conform their minds and hearts to His, becoming one with Him. God is more interested in our unity, brothers and sisters, than in diversity that is being pushed down our throats by the world. Quoting Doctrine and Covenants 38, 27, Be one, and if you are not one, you are not mine, is his everlasting decree to his saints. The church is not a democracy, but a theocracy. It is run by God. It is his doctrines. It is him who we follow. It is him who we become one with. Church members were divided into fact fractions. And some of these divisions were based on who had performed their baptisms. See 1 Corinthians 1, 12 through 16. Paul taught that there was no status gained by receiving baptism from a specific individual. Members were to be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment with Christ at their head. Perfect unity is a goal the church is still seeking. There are today word of wisdom faddists who will use, not use white flour or refined sugar. There are so-called liberals who think the problems of religion can be solved by dialogues and discussions without reference to revelation. There are others who maintain the church to follow the world's course of social progress. There are those who try and harmonize the evolutionary concepts of the day with the revealed account of the fall and atonement. And there are others who profess to believe that full salvation is reserved for those who practice plural marriage, and so on. In other words, there are some of one philosophy and some of another. Some follow the advocates of this cultish view and some of that. How apt it is that the Lord chose to paraphrase Paul's language concerning divisive groups in the church when he spoke of those who be thrust down to hell and who after their suffering shall come forth to receive a celestial inheritance. Quoting Doctrine and Covenants 76, 99-101, Christ said, These are they who are of Paul and of Apollos and Cephas. These are they who say they are of some of one and some of another, some of Christ and some of John, some of Moses, some of Elias, and some of Isaiah, some of Isaiah and some of Enoch. 
but received not the gospel, neither the testimony of Jesus, neither the prophets, neither the everlasting covenant. So those who cause division and maintain division within the church, instead of becoming united in Christ, are those who will inherit a celestial inheritance. 1 Corinthians 1.13 is Christ divided. There is and can be only one true church on the earth. Down through Covenants 1.30. To imagine that two organizations teaching different systems of salvation can both be true in a is, is a philosophical absurdity that is almost unbelievable. God cannot have a body of flesh and bones and also be a spirit essence without a body. Two conflicting religions can both be false, but only one can be true. Truth is truth. All truth is in harmony with all truth. There are not and cannot be two ways to gain celestial glory. Christ is not divided. The mere existence of the conflicting sects of Christendom is exclusive proof of the great apostasy. The fact that any or all of them, as Paul expressed it, says, I am of Christ, has almost no bearing whatsoever on the issue. Even the members of the church itself who are making this claim without also receiving the fullness of the law and accepting the whole gospel were among those severely rebuked by the inspired writer. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 17 through 19, verses 23 through 24, Paul's primary message was the preaching of the cross, which he taught was the power of God to save those who believe, 1 Corinthians 1.18. Paul used the phrase the cross as a kind of shorthand reference to the atonement. See Ephesians 2.16 and Philippians 3.18. The atonement, however, involved more than Christ's death on the cross. Elder C. Scott Grow of the Quorum of Seventy taught, Through his suffering and death, the atonement included Christ's suffering both in the Garden of Gethsemane and on the cross. Say Savior, the Savior atoned for the sins of all men. His atonement began in Gethsemane and continued on the cross and culminated with the resurrection. Paul's commission was to declare the doctrines of salvation in plainness and to testify of their truth. Many were baptized and became heirs of salvation. But as with the Lord's latter-day ministers, he was also sent to raise the warning voice, whether men believe or not, so that all would be left without excuse in the day of judgment. That's Doctrine and Covenants 88, 81 through 82. The phrase, not with wisdom of the world, Paul was saying, not with oratorical power, not with the witchery of words, but in plain, simple, and compelling manner. God's gospel would not be preached by the so-called wisdom of men. Gospel truth, like foolish, like foolish nonsense to the spiritually illiterate, but to the saints, who if they continue faithful shall be saved, they are as the voice of God. Neil A. Maxwell stated, we will sometimes appear to be weak and foolish in terms of the criteria the world uses to measure wisdom and strength. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. 1 Corinthians 1.18 As irreligion becomes the secular religion, it will be even more so. But the contempt of the world has its uses too. The Lord has declared time and time again his intentions to use such individuals in spite of how the world feels about them. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 20-23 God is known only by revelation. All the wisdom of the world combined cannot search him out. He stands forever. He stands revealed or remains forever unknown. 
Religion is a thing of the spirit. It is known, made known by revelation. Hence it is foolishness to the carnal mind. And thus the only ministers who can save people through preaching are those to whom God is revealed and who preach by the power of the spirit. Scientific research, of course, sustains and supports many of the truths of revealed religion. For instance, the ordered system which prevails in the universe of itself bears record of a supreme intelligence. To preach the gospel is to preach the atoning sacrifice of Christ, for the atonement is the gospel, 3 Nephi 27, 13-21. All doctrines and principles rest on and are efficacious because of the shedding of his blood. Thus, none actually preach the gospel in purity unless they testify as a result of personal revelation of Christ and declare the doctrine that led men to be like him. When Paul spoke against the wisdom of the world in 1 Corinthians 1.20, he was referring to the flawed philosophical traditions of his day and not to the worthwhile pursuit of learning and education that the Lord encourages. Paul used the words wise and wisdom repeatedly in 1 Corinthians 1, 17 through chapter 2, verse 13, to refer to worldly philosophies and those who support them. Philosophical ideas were regularly the subject of public debate. Paul contrasted limited human wisdom with the powerful message of God's crucified Son. See 1 Corinthians 1, 17-25. Regardless of those who scoff at the gospel, the saints' faith should not depend on the wisdom of men, but the power of God. The message of a crucified Messiah was difficult for both Jew and Gentiles to accept. In the Roman world, crucifixion was a punishment reserved for criminals or slaves and symbolized shame and defeat. The idea of some vicarious suffering and dying for others was subsequently coming back to life was foolishness to the philosophical mind minded Greeks. 1 Corinthians 1.23 For the Jews who, whose concept of the Messiah brought the expectation of royalty, power, and victory, the message that the Messiah had died on a cross was a stumbling block and an unacceptable idea. 1 Corinthians 1.23 1 Corinthians 1.24-30 Question, how is it that weak and untried persons have spiritual power an understanding which is often denied the learned and worldly wise. These are some of the things that are asked and answered in these verses of 24 through 30. Answer. It is in large measure a matter of pre-existence preparation. Some people developed in the pre-mortal life the talents to recognize truth to comprehend spiritual things, to receive revelation from the Spirit others did not. Those so endowed spiritually were foreordained and sent to earth to serve as God's command as his ministers. So this is what Paul is trying to explain in these verses. Hence we find Paul extolling the spiritual powers of the weak and the simple and decrying the foolishness of the worldly wise who seek religious preferment and status on the basis of intellectuality and persuasive powers. In our day, the Lord has taken the same approach. I call upon the weak things of the world, he said, those who are unlearned and despised, to thrash the nations by the power of my spirit, Dr. Covenants 35.13. To Joseph Smith, he said, I have raised you up that I might show forth my wisdom through the weak things of the world. Then you see 124, 1, and then 17, verse 17 to 24. Consider Joseph Smith was probably considered one of the most of the weak things when it came to worldly wisdom, education, knowledge. 
But boy, was he raised up to show the power of God and how much knowledge and power he had gained through the Holy Ghost. 1 Corinthians one twenty seven, Nil Elder Nil A. Maxwell noted, The weak things of the world shall come forth and break down the mighty and the strong ones, DNC one nineteen, to prepare the weak for those things which are coming on the earth, and for the Lord's errand in the day when the weak shall confound the wise, and the little one become a strong nation, and by the weak things of the earth, the Lord shall thrash the nations by the power of his Spirit. DNC 133, 58 to 59. That the fullness of my gospel might be proclaimed by the weak and the simple unto the ends of the world, and therefore kings and rulers. DNC 123. Wherefore I call upon the weak things of the world, those who are unlearned and despised, to thrash the nations by the power of my spirit. DNC 35, 13. God will use his power, his wisdom, his intelligence, his truth, his knowledge, not the intellectual, philosophical nonsense of the world. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 24 through 30 continued. Lest we resist even inwardly being so described, let us remember how noble are some who are included, such as Joseph Smith. This is the continuation of Elder Maxwell's quote. We will also feel foolish because we are very conscience, con conscious of our own actual weakness. Indeed, the Lord has even indicated that he will bring our weakness vividly to our attention. Nevertheless, the Lord showed us our weakness that we may know that it is by his grace and his condescension unto the children of men that we have power to do these things. And if men come unto me, I will show unto them their weakness. I give unto men weakness that they may be humble, and my grace is sufficient for all men that humble themselves before me. For if they humble themselves before me and have faith in me, then will I make weak things become strong unto them. 8 through 12, 27. It should give us some consolation to know, however, that other disciples, far more advanced than we, have had some of these same feelings. Paul, in addition to his thorn in the flesh, apparently was not impressive in terms of physical appearance. Like us, he noticed that others noticed. For his letters say that they are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. So even those that we revere in the church still struggle with feeling weak and not capable and must seek the power and spirit of God. God's ministers who have the Holy Spirit are in Christ. They received by revelation that wisdom about righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, which guides men to salvation. Elder President Boyd K. Packer, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, explained how the Lord uses common members of the church to further his work, saying, The church has no professional clergy. The call to leadership positions worldwide is drawn from the congregation. We have no seminaries for the training of professional leaders. Everything is done in the church, the leading, the teaching, the calling, the ordaining, the praying, the singing, the preparation of the sacrament, the counseling, and everything else is done by ordinary members, the weak things of the world. Can you see God's wisdom in doing this? If we relied upon religious, intellectual religious knowledge through seminaries and teachers and colleges that others use to be ordained and called to service, then we would not rely upon the gift of God and the Holy Ghost. We would rely upon our own wisdom. By using the weak and foolish things of the world, we are then forced to turn to him for grace so that we may know how to fulfill our callings and by turning to him, we learn more about him. We learn to love him, and we learn to receive his grace 
and to be saved by him. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Gospel preached and powered by the Spirit. Paul was exceptionally intelligent and well-educated. He, he could have impressed the Corinthians with rhetoric, philosophy, and sexual, sec, secular learning, but he deliberately focused on teaching the message of Jesus Christ simply and humbly. That is a good example set for us. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. Either minister of religion receive revelation, or they do not. If they do not, their words do not carry the final converting seal. Granted, they may say things that are true, but truth alone is not enough. Pure religion is a thing of the spirit and not of the intellect alone. And its truths must be carried into hearts of hearers by the power of the spirit. Otherwise, the human soul is not changed. The old man of sin is not crucified, and the seeker after salvation does not become alive in Christ. I remember an incident I had with one individual who wanted to ask specific questions of the church, not in a way to try to trip me up or demean the church, but just had sincere questions. And as I tried to answer the questions that this person had, it became very evident that everything that what she believed in, her gospel knowledge, was based on the intellect. And that praying and seeking the Spirit was not even a process by which she had even considered. Either it had to be true to her intellect, or she could not accept it. I even asked her, have you prayed about these things? Have you received a witness of the Spirit? And that was such a foreign concept to her. If there is any truth of salvation that deity has made imperishably clear, it is that first and last in all ages, now and forever, among the learned and the ignorant, for all races and people, and for, and for that matter, on all the endless worlds of the great creator, there is one formula and one formula only for conveying saving truths to men, preached by the power of the Spirit. It is the Holy Ghost that converts and reveals knowledge, not us. Doctrine and Covenants 42, 14-17 says, And the Spirit shall be given unto you by the prayer of faith. And if you receive not the Spirit, ye shall not teach. There are two ways to translate that or to interpret that. If you don't have the Spirit of God and are not seeking that in your life and, live, and trying the best you can to live to have the Spirit, then you have no business in teaching in the church. The other is, if you are in a class and you're called and you're teaching and you're teaching by your intellect alone, not by the power of the Holy Ghost, then you're not really teaching anything. Verse 15, And all this ye shall observe to do as I have commanded you concerning your teaching, until the fullness of my scriptures is given. And as ye shall lift up your voice by the Comforter, ye shall speak and prophesy, seemeth me good. For behold, the Comforter knoweth all things, and beareth record of the Father and the Son. We are to teach by the Spirit and power of the Holy Ghost, not by the intellectual wisdom of the world. Doctrine and Covenants 50, verses 13 22 continue this idea, says, Wherefore I, the Lord, ask you this question, unto what were ye ordained? To preach my gospel by the Spirit, even the Comforter, which was sent forth to teach the truth, and then receive ye spirits which ye could not understand, and receive them to be of God. And in this are ye justified? Behold, ye shall answer this question yourselves. Nevertheless, I will be merciful to you. He that is weak among you shall hereafter shall be made strong. Verily I say unto you, He that is ordained of me and sent forth to preach the word of truth by the Comforter in the Spirit of Truth, 
Doth he preach it by the Spirit of truth or some other way? Am I preaching the gospel and teaching the class primary gospel doctrine, whatever, young men, young women, am I teaching by the power and spirit of the Holy Ghost or some other way? Some other way would be by my own intellect. And if it be by some other way, it is not of God. And again, he that receiveth the truth. See, there's two parts in teaching. We focus mostly just on the person standing up there teaching. Those listening have a responsibility too. And again, he that receiveth the word of truth, doth he receiveth it by the spirit of truth or some other way? What would be some other way to receive it? How many times have you seen people during sacrament meeting, even during the sacrament itself, or during classes, on their phones, texting, or checking Facebook, or whatever it might be? That would be receiving it by some other way. If it be by some other way, it is not of God. Therefore, why is it that ye cannot understand and know? that he that receiveth the word by the spirit of truth, receive it, and it is preached by the spirit of truth. So if the teacher and the listener will both have the Holy Ghost, then wherefore he that preacheth and he that receiveth understand one another, and both are edified and rejoice together. Second Nephi 28.4 says, One of the signs of the apostasy is that ministers of religion shall contend one with another, and their priests shall contend with, an, with another, and they shall teach with their learning, and deny the Holy Ghost which giveth utterance. President Brigham Young explained how his own conversion resulted from a missionary who taught by the power of the Spirit. If all the talent, tact, wisdom, and refinement of the world had been combined in one individual, that person had been sent to me with the Book of Mormon and declared in the most exalted of earthly eloquence the truth of it, undertaken to prove it by his learning and worldly wisdom, I would have, it would have been to me like the smoke which rises only to vanish. But when I saw a man without eloquence or talent for public speaking who could only just say, I know, by the power of the Holy Ghost, that the Book of Mormon is true, that Joseph Smith is a prophet of God, the Lord, the Holy Ghost proceeding from that individual Im illuminates my mind, understanding, and light, glory, and immortality is before me. I am enriched by it. I am filled with it. And I know for myself that the testimony of the man is true. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. Wisdom is of two kinds. One, the wisdom of men, or the wisdom of the world. And two, the wisdom of God. One is of the intellect alone. The other is the mind of God, and is given to man by revelation. One is foolishness, and profiteth nothing. That would be the wisdom of man in the world. The other leads to happiness, which is prepared for the saints. 2 Nephi 9, 28, 43. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7. The mysteries of God are those things which are known only by revelation. When you gain a witness that God really lives, you are learning one of the mysteries of God by revelation. Elinil A. Maxwell states that when Paul referred to mysteries, he is meaning the fundamentals, not complicated mysteries. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 9 through 16. Paul reminded his readers that a worldly-minded person cannot comprehend spiritual truths because the things of the Spirit must be spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians 2, 14. Spiritual knowledge can be obtained only through the means that God has prepared. As Elder Paul V. Johnson of the Seventy taught, he said, In the scientific world, the scientific method is used to learn truth and advance knowledge. It has been extremely helpful over the years and has yielded tremendous amounts of scientific knowledge and continues to push back the curtain of ignorance about our physical world. Learning spiritual things, however, 
requires a different approach to learning scientific things. The scientific method and intellect are very helpful, but they alone will never bring spiritual knowledge. Learning spiritual things involves the intellect, but that is not enough. We only learn thing, spiritual things by the spirit. Answers to spiritual questions are given to individuals who don't harden their hearts, who ask in faith, believing they will receive, who diligently keep the commandments. Even when we follow this pattern, we don't control the timing of getting answers. Sometimes our answers come quickly, and sometimes we must place questions on the shelf for a time and rely on our faith that he has developed from the answers we do know. President Dallin H. Oaks was the first presence he taught. The Lord prescribed methods of acquiring sacred knowledge are very different from the methods used by those who acquire learning exclusively by study. For example, a frequent technique of scholarship is debate or adversarial discussion, a method which I have had considerable personal experience. But the Lord has instructed us in ancient and modern scriptures that we should not contend over the points of doctrine. 3 Nephi 11, 28-30 and Doctrine and Covenants 10, 63. Gospel truths and testimonies are received from the Holy Ghost through the reverent personal study and quiet contemplations. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered in the heart of men the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Compared to Doctrine and Covenants 7610, which says, For by my spirit will I enlighten them, and by my power I will make known unto them the secrets of my will, yea, even those things which I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor yet entered in the heart of man. What a great promise Paul gives us if we will stay faithful. Bruce R. McConkie said, We never can comprehend the things of God and of heaven, the, prophets, the prophet, the angel of Smith said, except by revelation. That is the sum and substance of the whole matter. Until men receive personal revelation, they are without God in the world. They are not on the course leading to salvation and they cannot go where God and Christ are. Revelation comes only from the Holy Ghost. Men may study about religion, about God, about his laws, but they cannot receive that knowledge of them whom to know is eternal life except by revelation from the Spirit of God. Those who receive revelation are on the path leading to salvation. Those who do not receive revelation are not on the path and, not, and cannot be saved and thus they repent and get in tune with the Spirit. Brothers and sisters, the minute we learn how to use the Holy Ghost and how to use the gifts of the Holy Ghost daily in our lives is the day that Satan hates. Because he knows that if we learn to use the power of the Holy Ghost in our lives, that he cannot influence us at all. The Holy Ghost is a teacher, and by the power of the Holy Ghost, you may know the truth of all things. The natural man, meaning the worldly man, the man who is carnal, sensual, and devilish by nature, the man who has not put on Christ, who has not been born again by the power of the Spirit. The natural man is an enemy to God and has been from the fall of Adam and will be for and ever and ever unless he yields to the enticings of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 2.16 Christ acts and speaks by the power of the Spirit, and by the power of the Holy Ghost you may know the truth of all things. Romans 10, 5. Therefore, those saints who walk in the light as he is in the light, who keep his commandments, who actually enjoy the pre presentment or gift given them following baptism, thereby have his mind. They think what he thinks, know what he knows, say what he would say, and do what he would do in every situation, all by revelation from the Spirit. That is our challenge. Let's now go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Being carnal, 
versus seeking and obtaining the Spirit of God. Paul counsels the members. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Paul counsels the members that be because of their carnal nature that all mankind obtained obtained because of the fall. Uh, let me start again. I apologize. First of all, the heading was wrong. Being carnal versus seeking and obtaining the Spirit. Paul counsels members that because of their carnal nature that all mankind obtained, obtained because of the fall, he cannot speak unto them the more meaningful things of the Spirit. In this fallen state, we are subject to the lusts, passions, and appetites of the flesh, become spiritually dead, having been cut out of the presence of the Lord, and thus they are without God in the world, and they have gone contrary to the nature of God. They are in a carnal state. They are of the world. Carnality connotes worldliness, sensuality, and inclination to gratify the flesh. So that's what Paul is trying to teach in verses 1 through 4. Salvation comes as men forsake carnality and turn to the things of the Spirit. They must be born again, yea, born of God, changed from their carnal and fallen to a state of righteousness, being redeemed of God, becoming his sons and daughters, all accountable persons who have not received the truth and the spiritual rebirth that attends such reception are yet in a carnal state. Paul warns the members of the church who have not forsaken the world and who have not bridled their passions are yet in a carnal state. You are carnal, Paul said to the Corinthian saints. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is an enemy against God. Romans 8, 6, 7 and 2 Nephi 9, 39. Thus we must learn to drink milk before we can eat meat. That's verse 2. Referring to that all must learn line upon line and precept upon precept. Alma said, It is given unto many to know the mysteries of God. Nevertheless, they are laid under a strict command that they shall not impart only according to the portion of his word which he doth grant unto the children of men, according to the heathen diligence which they give unto him. And therefore, he that will harden his heart, the same shall receive the lesser portion of the word. And he that will not harden his heart, to him is given the greater portion of the world, until it is given unto him to know the mysteries of God, until he know them in full. Alma 12, 9 through 10. 1 Corinthians 3, 4 through 7. God gave the increase. In 1 Corinthians 3, 4 through 7, Paul used the metaphor of planting and harvesting to illustrate that missionaries are instruments in the hands of God, but it is God that gives the increase, meaning that God causes the changes in people's hearts and souls that leads to conversion. In the Book of Mormon, Ammon, Ammon expressed similar sentiments. In Alma 26, 11, 32, he said, But Ammon said unto them, I do not boast in my own strength, nor in my own wisdom, but behold, my joy is full. Yea, my heart is brim with joy, and I will rejoice in my God. Yea, I know that I am nothing as to my strength. I am weak. Therefore, I will not boast of myself, but I will boast of my God, for in his strength I can do all things. Yea, behold, many mighty miracles have we wrought in this land, for which we will praise his name forever. Behold, how many thousands of our brethren has he loosed from the pains of hell, and they are brought to sing redeeming love, and this because of the power of his word which is in us. Therefore we have not great reason to rejoice. Yea, we have reason to praise him forever, for he is the most high God, and has loosed our brethren from the chains of hell. Brothers and sisters, not one of us can convert somebody else. We can explain. We can give examples. But we cannot convert even. That is done by revelation through the Holy Ghost. 
In 1 Corinthians 3, 8, one plants, another waters, one sows, another reaps. One makes friends for the church, another teaches deep doctrines. What matters is that all are needful, all are ministers, and God giveth the increase. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 10 through 11. Paul, as a wise master builder, laid the foundation for the Corinthian church on Christ and his atoning sacrifice. Similarly, in this day, Joseph Smith said, the fundamental principles of our religion are the testimony of the apostles and prophets concerning Jesus Christ, that he died, was buried, and rose again on the third day and ascended into heaven. And all other things pertaining to our religion are only appendages to it. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. If the building and the saints, or God's building, conforms to God's blueprint, it will become a stable structure, which will stand the fiery test. Otherwise, it will be burned and destroyed. And the same is true of all men. If their works are good, they shall abide the day and not be cast into the fire. Otherwise, when he who is like a refiner's fire sits in judgment, they shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up. So we must be careful. If we decide as a church not to conform to God's blueprint, he is under no obligation to save this church. It can be destroyed by those from within if we choose not to follow. 3 Nephi 27, 10 through 12, going along with this, says, If it so be that the church is built upon my gospel, then will the Father show forth his works in them. But if it be not built upon my gospel and is built upon the works of men or upon the works of the devil, verily I say unto you, they have joy in their works for a season. And by and by the end cometh, and they are hewn down and cast into the fire, from whence there is no return. For the works do follow them, for it is because of their works that they are hewn down. That should be down, not done. And as to false churches, churches built upon gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, stubble, all such shall be burned. And the great and abominable church, which is the whore of all the earth, shall be cast down by devouring fire. Thoughts from Covenants 29, 21. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 through 17. Ye are the temple of God. Paul taught, know ye not that ye are God's temple? In this verse, Paul uses ye, a plural pronoun, to refer to the Corinthian saints collectively as God's temple. Paul's point was that the congregations of the church functions as temples when the Spirit of God could dwell. This analogy is subtle is subtly different from the one that Paul used later in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, in which he compared a person's physical body to a temple. To be clean is to be saved. To be filthy is to be damned. No unclean thing can inherit the kingdom of heaven. The whole plan and system of salvation is designed to enable men to take the worldly souls they now possess and to cleanse and perfect them through baptism of water and of the Spirit. Indeed, the very purpose of baptism is to empower men to be sanctified by the reception of the Holy Ghost, that they may be spotless before the Lord at the last day. See 35, 27, 19 to 21. Destruction awaits those who defile their bodies, temples, unless they repent. Shortly before the coming of Christ, the Nephites began to disbelieve in the spirit of prophecy and in the spirit of revelation and the judgments of God that stare them in the face. The spirit of the Lord did no more preserve them, yea, it had withdrawn from them because the spirit of the Lord does not dwell in unholy temples. Therefore the Lord did cease to preserve them from his miraculous and matchless power. For they had fallen into a state of unbelief and awful wickedness. That was said in Helaman 4, 23-25. Precisely this same thing happened to the church in the old world, following the death of the apostles, prophets, and other inspired men who had the spirit of revelation, because the spirit dwelt in thee. 
1 Corinthians 3, 18 through 23. In this life, those who are learned, who have intellectual capacity, who gain scholastic degrees are held up to dignity and renown. Their views are sought, their opinions are valued. But from the Lord's eternal perspective, there is almost no language sufficient to appreciate the importance of intellectuality standing alone and to magnify the eternal worth of spirituality. There is no salvation in intellectuality standing alone. The wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. But through spirituality, the door is open to the saints to progress until they inherit all things, literally all things, including all the intellectual, um, intellectuality known in the world and more. Those who seek the Lord, who find Him, who keep His commandments, who grow in the things of the Spirit, shall gain the fullness of the kingdom of the Father. They gain exaltation. They become gods. They inherit all things, literally. Why then, Paul contends, should the saints glory in intellectuality in the wisdom of the world? And the Lord in the latter day revelation makes the same presentation. Speaking of those who gain exaltation, he says, All things are theirs, whether life or death, or things present or things to come. All are theirs, and they are Christ, and Christ is God's. And they shall overcome all things, whether let no man glory in man, but rather let him glory in God who shall subdue all enemy under his feet. Paul and God are not diminishing the pursuit of the learning of things of the world, but warning, oh, that cunning plan of the evil one, oh, the vainness and the frailties and foolishness of men. When they are learned, they think they are wise, and they hearken not unto the counsel of God, for they set it aside, supposing they know of themselves Wherefore, their wisdom is foolishness, and it profiteth them not, and they shall perish. But to be learned is good if, and I would add only if, they hearken unto the counsels of God. 2 Nephi 9, 28-29 Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button and consider subscribing to the channel.